is very theoretical, like uh, the crypto analysis of, of A51 and A52, which is turning more practical right now, but then at least for the last decade it was very theoretical. On application level, you also find security analysis. Um, but yeah, well, that's a different topic altogether. Of course, if there's a web browser on the phone, then of course I can try to exploit bugs in that web browser. But that doesn't really relate to GSM. It relates to the web browser that, that happens to run on, on a mobile computer that people tend to call phone rather computer. But it is not inherently a, a GSM or, or a 3G security issue. So there are no open source implementations, well, at least until about a year ago, or well, one and a half years ago. Um, and that means that people cannot really learn about the protocols uh, in a practical way. I mean, everyone here understands that if, if I have some, some system running in front of me and I can play with it and I can actually, um, you know, make it do some things, then uh, that is much more, uh, you will have much more interest in learning about it, um, as opposed to just reading in a textbook and yes, okay, there is somebody at an operator who can configure this portion of his network in a certain way and then it might behave differently. But then that's like, hmm, okay. Um, you can't really try it. And if you cannot try it, um, many people are not interested in it. So if you wanted to do a security analysis of GSM and on a protocol level, what would you do? Um, there is uh, two or well, different approaches to do that, of course. You can try to address the problem from the handset side. Um, so you can, you can try to do something like, impl like modifying an existing uh, um, handset uh, or try to implement your own protocol stack on a handset or your own, you know, whatever, an uh, attack tool or whatever, like Dieter Spar did and just in the presentation that was uh, uh, preceding this presentation. You can do that, but it is extremely difficult um, since the firmware that runs on those uh, GSM baseband chips is, and the protocol stack inside that firmware is closed and proprietary in 99.9% um, .9 of the cases. And in uh, most of the cases, in addition, there is a DRM mechanism uh, with signed binaries, and you need to circumvent those mechanisms and so on. Yes, it can be done, but it is difficult. And given the size of the code that we're talking about, we're easily talking about somewhere between three or four megabytes of object code. This is not just a small you know, 10 kilobyte firmware image. It's, it's massive. Um, and if you want to reverse engineer reasonable amounts of the code in there, then uh, you will spend a lot of time and by the time you finish, the product is no longer sold anyway and nobody will be able to reproduce your, your results without uh, uh, you know, trying to hunt down some, some extremely old equipment on eBay. Um, so if you want to write your own protocol stack, not on a regular handset, or on any device, then of course you need documentation on the, the baseband chipset. And yes, of course there is an ARM CPU in that, but okay, you know, the interesting part is the peripherals, the memory map, the register level specification, how can I write actual drivers for the integrated peripherals in that chipset, not the fact that yes, there is an ARM instruction set. That's, that doesn't matter. Um, so it is undocumented and uh, you don't really get uh, much uh, um, access to this. There's two known attempts. Uh, one is the TSM30 project, um, which uh, well, uh, became part of the THC GSM project. Before that, it was called Project Black Sphere, but it's, it's um, uh, oh, sorry, no. The TSM30, pro <laughs> TSM30 project, which works with the TSM30 phone, and then that's also the MadOS project, which is part of Project Black Sphere on some old Nokia DCT3 phones, things like this, the 3310, which, yeah, as I say, it's very old hardware, hard to get, well, not hard, but, um, yeah. Uh, so, if you start now working on something like this, then by the time you're finished, uh, the hardware will be even, even less easily accessible. So there's not much, pro much, not much success coming out of these projects. Now, the other way you have is you, you try to address the problem from the network side. Um, the difficulty here is that the equipment typically is not available and uh, extremely expensive. Um, however, the network itself is very modular. Um, if you look at the GSM handset, you have everything in one device. If everything from you know, the layer zero, layer one, layer two, layer three, uh, including call control, mobility management, and so on, including the user interface, what they call man-machine interface, um, including application software and so on. So it's all one big massive chunk that's hard to attack, but on the network side, um, 
the, com the, the network is extremely modular. So um, there are all kinds of interfaces which are documented and which are exposed. And those interfaces are much easy, make it much easier because they are documented and you can, you can uh, write some software that, that um, uh, implements such an interface. Whereas these interfaces don't exist on a phone. On the phone, the interface is extremely high level. I mean, in a modern smartphone, you will get an API, make a phone call, and then you get, oh, you know, the call has been established. And that's, that's the kind of interface you get. Um, it's not, not any lower layers. And on the network side, the interfaces are much more low layer. However, um, well, of course, uh, how do you get the equipment? Um, but if equipment is available, then the progress, uh, I think, is much faster. And that's, uh, well, um, what uh, we did in the OpenBSC project. Um, well, how do you get started? You start to read the specifications. Um, it's a lot. So the important task is identifying which documents you need to read and which not, and trying to puzzle them together. Um, the complete GSM specification is more than one, more than a thousand PDF documents. Um, while you start to read about them, you you get more knowledge. There are a couple of books, but not many that can help. Um, you obtain some actual equipment. In this case, BTSs have been bought on eBay by various people. Um, today, since GSM is already a relatively old technology, um, you can get some old uh, surplus equipment on eBay, uh, not, not too difficult way. Even today, as I speak, um, I think there's a couple of BTSs for somewhere around $500, $600 on eBay. Um, it's just, uh, you know, you get one of these devices and then you reverse engineer the couple of bits that are missing. Um, and uh, work with the protocols that are specified, and then you can play with the GSM protocol security. So this process is what has happened um, uh, with OpenBSC over the last year. The project was started in somewhere October last year, um, and uh, today um, it is at a status where you can run a complete GSM network, which is uh, what a number of people have been using here at this uh, very Congress. So if you look at the GSM network, we have a certain structure. Um, we have the actual mobile phone here on the left hand side and the air interface is called UM interface. Then we have BTSs which are dumb stupid transceivers. They receive signals on, on a radio wave, they demodulate it, decode it, do some error correction and so on, and then they forward it on a wired interface which is called ABIS here. And then you get the base station controller um, which uh, controls a number of these BTSs. You can see a second one here. And you have all kinds of other equipment in the core network. Um, so what we did in OpenBSC is we got one of these BTSs, we got a number of phones, um, and we implemented the remaining parts of the core network and simulate the core network uh, to the BTS. And since this ABS interface is specified in, in public uh, documentation, you can actually do that. Um, well, this is some terminology. I'm going to skip that slide. Uh, it's just uh, if, you, if you want to check it out uh, on the slides later, you can do that. Um, the important interface is, as I said, UM for the air interface and ABIS for the interface between BTS and base station controller. Um, the networks themselves, one thing to keep in mind, they're extremely asymmetric, um, which means uh, they're very, very different from an end-to-end -end network like IP. If you work in GSM, never think about IP. It will just confuse you. It's completely different. Uh, you can find a lot of similarities between GSM networks and um, uh, ISDN. So I, any ISDN knowledge you have is, is of a lot of use in, in GSM. Um, also, there's a lot of more similarity between SDH and, and uh, maybe even ATM and GSM than, than IP networks, on, on the other hand. It's really very different. Um, just to illustrate that fact, um, in any IP-based network, you will have a packet that has a source and destination address. In GSM, you will never have that. The source and destination are implicitly defined in when the packet occurs in a time division multiplex scheme. And you have to know a lot of context about the history, when this time slot was established in order to know from whom to whom the communication is happening. So never assume that there is source and destination information in a packet or something like that. You will only get the payload and then you have to uh, yeah, do some work to determine where it comes from and where it goes to. Um, there's a number of network protocols that are interesting when we do GSM protocol uh, level research. There's the radio layer, which is specified in what's called 04.04. .04. These are TS, technical specifications. So if you want to read up the documentation, you can use these numbers as references. There's